Causeway Street. When I was a child, my world began and ended in Causeway Street. Our house stood tall, sandwiched in a row of three storeys, which was almost reflected on the even side of the street. The obscure glass on the front door opened out onto the footpath. Two full paving stones wide, which readily became a hopscotch or a chalkboard or a place to park your pram to give your baby fresh air. The road was black and bubbled thick and viscous in the August sunshine before the council came and replaced it with the Devil's Road when I was four. I was scared to cross the new red-hued surface for fear it would burn the soles of my black patent shoes. We needed to cross the road for several reasons. If we wanted to go to Stockman's shop that had a big glass window covered with an orange cellophane blind to protect the homemade toffee apples and slabs of fudge in silver trays from the sun. Inside was always cool and dark and Mr Stockman would ask if you'd been a good girl and wink when you said yes and put his big hand into the glass jar on the counter and give you a bit of a broken biscuit to nibble on while he and Daddy chatted. Or, if you wanted to scoot up the dark alleyway adjacent to the shop, whose steep, uneven stone steps, too high for short legs, gave you a shortcut to the back of Hamilton Place. Or, on an odd Friday night visit to the Dolphin, the waft of fried fish and malt vinegar luring you in, the big stainless steel counter as warm as Frank's smile as he shoveled chips into the big brown bag before spinning it around and around to secure the ends in tiny knots. I loved carrying them home like a hot water bottle clasped around my hungry tummy before opening the bag on the formica top, white bread and butter all ready and waiting for the feast. Or to call from, for the Quigley girls or to borrow a tool from Jimmy. Daddy and him used to smoke gold bond together of an evening, leaning against the roof of the Morn's van, the red tip lighting their faces as they dragged. Our cousins, the Purdies, lived on the other side too, and Granny would stand in the middle of the road and cross them over if they wanted to visit her or come play with us. We were surrounded by paternal family. Dad's mother, three sisters and nephew Davy all lived in Causeway Street. Each house had its own special reward for visiting its occupants. A box of Macintosh's weekend assortment sat bold and colourful in Jean's mantelpiece for callers big and small. Josie always had jam or sugar sandwiches, which crunched on your teeth and stuck to your lips. Raya had an assortment of brass, well polished, and wooden figurines, which we would adorn with plaster scene jewellery and fancy hats. Granny's house was the grandest of them all, with her tiled step swept every morning and her cast iron summer seat where she would sit and watch the holidaymakers from Belfast parade up and down and admire her talent for growing busy lizzies which sat proud on a table at her front window. You crossed to go to Danny the Barber's to get your hair cut. The grown ladies went to Julie next door who wore her hair piled high and had fancy eyeglasses. But Danny did a decent bowl cut with a sensible short fringe that didn't get in your way when you were at school and destroy your eyesight. If you were old enough, you could walk up to the top of the street and go past the RUC checkpoint hut and cross over behind the rusty cement filled oil drums. You could give a note to Danny the butcher for a pound of minced steak and he'd give you the cold, tightly sellotaped wrappage to carry home. Ridley's shop would distract you on your way back with its buckets and spades blowing outside and promises of sweetie tobacco and sherbet dips 
as you jumped and skipped and avoided the cracks on the pavement as you made your return. On our side, we could walk to school or go to mass. Jimmy Branken sold the Sunday papers, which sat on a shelf below a counter brimmed full with fruit and vegetables, biscuits and chocolate bars and out-of-date goods at reduced prices. The sweet smell of dulse hit you as soon as you entered and Jimmy, in his grey working coat, would barter and chat and try and sell you what you didn't even know you needed. Next would be Bolton's entry. The white words, private, keep out, boldly emblazoned in white capital letters, standing out as a warning to intruders against the black tar. Almost 50 years later, and I'm still to disobey. Strandmore House is a vision only to be viewed from the East Strand. On a Saturday night, my sisters and I would clutch a single coin in one hand and join our free hands tight as we adventured down the street and braved the bogeyman who resided at the dark entrance to the beach. We were off to Ammon's shop to spend our pocket money. When we arrived, we would stop at the big white door, pause to get our breath before the biggest would push down on the heavy handle and we would bundle into the shop, the bell above the door loudly announcing our arrival. <clears throat> Inside was bright and warm and a rainbow of colour greeted our greedy eyes as the clip-clopping of Mrs Ammon's footsteps on the linoleum floor came into the shop. Well, what do you want, she would chirp, folding her slender arms tight across her flowered apron. But the best bit, by far, was a secret. If mummy opened our back door and you held the wooden rail that helped you down the back concrete steps, the East Strand was waiting for you in all its glory. In summer, it was golden and glorious and you could walk along the prom and smell the warm popcorn and candy floss in the air. Punch would be shouting loudly at Judy on the green under a red and white striped canopy. The synthetic sausages and crying baby and angry policeman would make me scared. Cowboy films were shown in the Arcadia on autumnal afternoons. We sat on metal tubular chairs with burgundy leather seats. And when it got dark early, we would come home to find Daddy eagerly checking the pool's results on the television, even though we hadn't played. The winters were wild and wonderful, and draughts whistled and blew through the house. The Atlantic was a backdrop to our bedroom. The window, a fifth wall, where I would press my nose against the cold glass and kiss the spray with my lips, writing my dreams in the midst. <laughs>